All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, finally, this uh, interview's uh, time has arrived. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Today, we have with us uh, former Senator and, of course, Attorney Leila Delima. Kamusta po kayo, Attorney? Oh, I'm fine. Very exhausting. For me, the past 12 days has been 12 days from my date of release. I'm still can't, can't get over it. I'm still getting my bearings, so to speak. You know, just um, adjusting to the environment. I'm, I still feel disoriented from it all. I still miss my own uh, cell there, my own <laughs> bed there, the whole surroundings. It's really very disorienting. Um, the um, supposed to be familiar things in my own home have become suddenly unfamiliar. So I'm still, I'm really still adjusting. Uh, yeah. Actually, that's why, Senator, I didn't want to uh, call it you earlier because I know you wanted to spend time with also with your family, loved ones. Of course, some of your, uh, you know, loved ones are actually friends of mine over Twitter. We we have been keeping in touch throughout the years, and as you may know, I mean, uh, you know, your case has been very, very close to our hearts. Uh, oh, you know, a lot of our common friends. Uh, some people know actually. The other year, mm -hmm. I almost had tears in my eyes. I had to control myself when I was talking mm -hmm. about your predicament. <laughs> But there was always an element of hope. Um, I always look forward to this moment. And and it looks like some of my prognostications about things turning in a better way ha has turned out. But before we go into uh, your legal case and your broader hopes for Philippine democracy, Sir De Lima, I mean, the last time we met was when you were still in detention. I remember we discussed yes. about... You paid the visit, yeah. I know. We talked about Mandela. We talked about... Um, Stoicism. We talk about faith, no, and and the scripture and Bible. So it was a very spiritual meeting, and 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 to be honest, I was I was very touched by our meeting, uh, no, because I saw the strength of character, you know, and I was also very impressed. Na talagang maliwalas kayo. I mean, considering everything you were going through, so there was this kind of an almost a soulful, um, parang ano, beyond the fray na kayo. There was this kind of a spiritual aura there. So, so how did you arrive at that, Senator De Lima? Uh, can you tell me first about kung ba, mag lifestyle guru tayo? Like, if you're going to give advice on resilience, strength, and conviction, can you tell us your journey? Because this is really one of a kind. Yeah, my whole ordeal has really been liberating. And it's really all well, just a matter of attitude. You know, your, the, the correct mindset, uh, setting your right mindset on a daily basis. That you get to, you, you've got to have your daily ordeal or your your daily uh, uh things to do must be set must be scheduled keep yourself busy and and always have a purpose because you, you can never tell the next day you're no longer around and and um you just have to make the most of every day of every moment in in life in detention so um my Routine has been very strict on a daily basis from the waking up hours and up to the last hours of the night until I get sleepy from readings because I, I, I have longer hours of reading. I have longer hours of praying compared to when I was still not in detention and um, make appreciating everything around you. Um, Small, even small blessings in life, even the simplest moments in life, you get to find joy in it because you have a very limited environment, physical environment. So everything there seemed to be very important to you. Everything there seemed to be valuable to you. And everything there seemed to be, it, it's just your whole world now. So it's its all important. You're, you're, you're not wasting time you now realize which are the most essential things in your life and which ones you can do without. So simple, mundane things suddenly become valuable, essential matters to you simply because of your very limited and constrained life. And it's a matter of psyche. It's a matter of attitude, uh, dealing with it properly with the right psychology. Yeah. Senator, can we go back to this? I mean, how did you arrive at this kind of uh, disciplined routine that carried you through those very difficult years? Because it just 
just a prospect of uncertainty. I remember the last time we were taking uh, uh together, we were talking. Parang hindi sure na you will ever be uh even be granted the, the, the bail. So how did you cope with? How did you arrive at that routine? Well, almost instantly, just a few days from uh, uh, incarceration, I I told myself I have to be busy. I have to have this routine. I have to do something. I cannot afford to be idle. I cannot afford to entertain negativism. I cannot afford to be distressed. And 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 so there's never been any any moment that I feel depressed because that's what I was trying to avoid. Yes, I would I would be lonely at times. I would even cry at times, especially the first few months thinking about my family thinking about my home and thinking about why it happened to me it was initially an a feeling of utter disbelief of what happened to me of what was done to me that i've got to accept it that now i have i'm in this situation and i've got as i said deal with it properly as best as i could Senator, the reason I'm asking this is, you know, I mean, uh, in many ways I can relate to because you're, you know, you're a very ambitious person. You were very successful in your career. You went, you know, from one high to another high. I mean, becoming, I mean, he's chief of the CHR and then becoming the justice secretary, very high profile, then becoming the senator of the republic. I mean, you need a certain kind of uh, spirit behind that kind of ambitious and successful life. And then now suddenly you're facing this very uncertain, almost martyr-like moment. So how did that psychological transition uh, go through? Was it, is it, did something switch on in you or suddenly like there was a moment of spiritual awakening? I mean, what's going on? The reason I'm asking is because we have another precedent, right? See Ninoy, diba? Ninoy was a very ambitious, successful politician and then things went really wrong for him. Then suddenly something else came out of him, right? Kayapi, what we'll about the young Ninoy and then the more wise, almost prophetic kind of Ninoy. Um, did you also go through that kind of transition or something switched on in you? Well, definitely I, I had a palpable spiritual growth in confinement because I had enough time really to pray, enough time to read the Bible, to do contemplative prayer, to do um, reflection. So deep in faith, uh, um, I, I would devotional prayers, devotional readings, a lot of those. So and so spiritual awakening. I I I wasn't that prayerful before. I I I, I hardly read Bible before. Um, the, the Nino Bible said exactly me. the same thing. I think Nino, he had an uh, interview with Seven Hundred Club or something. Uh, he was not really a particular pious person, and then suddenly he realized, no, yeah, there's something else yes. to use life and even. So when I started praying, praying the Rosary, contemplative prayers, and reading the Bible, the Scriptures, then I could feel that spiritual growth in me, the purification process, the liberating. Uh, uh, the, the feeling of liberation. So that is the awakening. That is the blessing. That is the blessing of the whole ordeal. It is initially a curse because I did not deserve to be in jail, but it turned out to be a blessing. Because of that, I became closer to God. I had conversations with God. I had intimate sessions with him. It's early evening. Uh, after Angelus and before I, I, I wrote in my journal. So th that's correct. Um, that's um, the whole environment would lead you to that. Um, when, you, when you say liberation, spiritual liberation, is it also, you know, the fact that, you know, for year after year, you're, you're thinking about the political landscape, you're talking about, you're thinking about your political survival, your political success, and then suddenly you, you can put all of that aside and go to the very fundamentals of what it is to live a life, you know, to be a righteous. Is it also that kind of, you know, just like casting away all of those exactly. everyday calculus and, you know, survival and all of that? You're yeah. right. Is the fundamental existence and your worth as a Christian, as a Catholic. I was born a Christian. 
I was born and raised as a Catholic. I'm going back to the fundamentals because in between, in the interlude, I was not really that faithful in the sense that yes, I would go to the I would go to Sunday masses, but not, you know, all other obligations were not there. We're not being observed. Now suddenly, because again of the environment, I was forced to go back to the basics as a Christian and as a Catholic. So wala na muna yung iba. Let's 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 just focus on this. To me, that's more important. And I was there, that's more important. Even I see that there were a lot of things happening outside in the political world, but I said no, I want I want this this moment. I want this situation that I'm I have a direct line to God that I'm very comfortable talking to him, communicating with him. And it feels just so good. Yeah, you know, uh, Senator, it's that kind of a sublime, uh, sublime yeah. feeling and sub sublime aura that uh, I, I I noticed the the last time we had that kind of conversation. Um, Senator, I, I you know, Attorney Delima, I had a question. Um, what about the aspect? I mean, you talked about a lot about you know recentering yourself and casting away all of those distractions and all, but what about the element of the element of forgiveness and the element of, um. Let's be honest. I mean, when when everything turned on you, there was a, a lot of horrible things being said, not only against you, but a lot of against anyone who tried to stand up to Duterte. I mean, all of us in our own little ways, you know, have been victim of, of that kind of Dutertismo ideology, whatever you want to call it. Of course, your case was the worst by far. And and to be I mean, honest, there were times I was wondering, Diko kilala yung mga aking mga kababayan. Like, how could they cheer on? etong drug war na pumapatay ng mga ordinaryong pe people. I, I couldn't believe some people who were saying horrible things about you or Maria Ressa or Riza Ontiveros. And like parang hindi ko kilala tong bansa na to. Hindi ito yung mga kababayan na kilala. You, you get what I'm saying, uh, 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 Senator Delima? It was really difficult for me because mahal na mahal natin yung bayan natin. At mahal natin yung bayan natin dahil mahal natin yung mga kababayan natin. And then suddenly you're seeing this dark, ugly side of people, this mob... Uh, kind of uh, the, the culture and all, and it was really, it was not only scary, it was really disheartening and demoralizing. And I, I can imagine your case was thousand times worse than what a lot of us faced as anyone who dared to challenge Duterte on any issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, uh, uh, Attorney De Lima? Like, how did you deal with the question of forgiveness and uh, and understanding yung kababayan natin uh, how could they turn that way because I never thought we could turn this way or I never thought I would in my lifetime so I can imagine it was probably even more shocking in your case yes unimaginable because you know the 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 uh, this course that has afflicted our nation which is the social media you know it has you know in 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 uh, in many ways it's it's even more frightening than the uh, usual methods of cooptation and repression and even you know the the the, the bad habits and all that but um i felt that sa kabila niyan hindi ko hindi ko kasi kaya na hindi pa rin ako maniwala o magtiwala and have faith with our countrymen because i i knew and i felt and i believed that in the end most of the of the Filipino people would still know or would still be able to discern the good from the bad. So in spite of that, because of the various influences, and then we have the kind of leader that we had since 2016 that brought up that 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 brought up that created that kind of political environment of hatred, of, of negativism, of 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 of, of simply casting uh, negative things about um, certain personalities, and I was the chief target of that leader, then you can't blame the, the, uh, the, the, uh, some people who are gullible enough to accept those lies, those vilifications, to, to believe those, those uh, lies about you. Now, 
as I said, I never lost faith in the Filipino people that in the end, they would know that all this are simply trash. You know, so, and this, the forgiveness, the scriptures teach us to forgive our enemies. Even, well, our scriptures even tell us, teach us to love our enemies, although that is a bit too difficult. That is too much for me to love enemies. Forgive, forgiveness, I think, is enough. But uh, forgiveness also, as they say, is more for your sake so that you would have you would have no further burdens if because if you keep on 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 instilling this ill will against anyone then uh you will suffer psychologically and even health wise so ikaw din ang magsasuffer kung palagi kang may kinikimkim yun ang palagi mo inisip anyway bahala na sila bahala and, and, and i would always pray for them god Dear God, please give them the grace to understand what is true and what is good and what is right. And God, give me the grace to forgive these people. So that's my right. That's how I took it. I mean, of course. I mean, even in the scripture, no, we see how the Israelites sometimes were led astray. I mean, when, when Moses was just receiving the Ten Commandments, a lot of things were happening down there, right? And of course, what happened also to Jesus Christ? No, I mean, the kind of, you know, mob attack and the horrible things done to him, you know, before his, uh, you know, his, his martyrdom, right? Uh, so, so we have a lot of that. But you're also right. I mean, for me, uh, attorney, one of the ways I try to understand this was, Grievance, no. I mean, I think a lot of our Kababayan were just so frustrated with a lot of things that didn't go right, and this is not necessarily on you know the Aquino administration or or your tenure. It's just you know all the broken or half fulfilled promises after the collapse of the Marcos dictatorship. So, ako sabi ko, marami jan mga ano lang frustrated lang sila, and that has unfortunately made them more susceptible to this politics of hatred and fear and grievance that Dutertismo represented. But similar to you, I I, I get your point. Um, uh, Senator De Lima, which is, you know, this this is an unfortunate phase, but perhaps it's part of the maturation of our democracy and maturation of, you know, political consciousness among you mga kababayan natin. And I mean, I, I can tell you personally, like six, seven years ago, I, I would have doubted that, you know, people, thousands of people would be interested in political mm -hmm. analysis in the way we do. And now I see more and more people interested. So unfortunately, it was a difficult transition process, but I think it was unfortunately... Or perhaps it's just inevitable. It's part of the maturation process. Now, Sir Dilemma, I have another question. I mean, obviously, you know, we can talk about Jesus Christ and what he had to go through, you know, to fight for truth and to fulfill his uh his destiny. Um, but obviously there were also, you know, political figures like Mandela, among others, who also went through very, very difficult uh moments and eventually they came out triumphant and became a kind of an archetype of martyr political leader and democratic icon all at once to what degree were you inspired by the experiences of these people without of course anyone being presumptuous i mean we're just talking about role models that you were biographies were there biographies you were reading of uh heroes, well, that, heroes? Yeah. of course we're top the list we're top the list um, I, I i cannot cite any other because i've been reading a lot and there's been really a lot of role models and anyone who would stand for truth, anyone would stand for democracy. There are several democracy icons. There are several who really stand up for for uh, social justice. So I would not really. I'm not that type of person who would who would just be citing who my you know uh, my role models. I I I would want that I take examples from even from ordinary people who who take leap of faith who would who would um uh, take extra steps to to uh, make a difference in society now if we can go back backslide to our discussion on the uh, state of democracy and then the political climate i'd like to see that uh what's happening now is actually kind of normalization and the political stage of our country is a process of normalization after after the uh, major 
populist disruption that was the Duterte regime. See, this is a time to strengthen the institutions that Duterte destroyed. And again, that's why I've been, I've been uh, commending the, uh, this administration in its respect for the rule of law and the judiciary, because it, it, you know, it would aid greatly in restoring the people's faith in the judiciary. And um, I hope that the people have uh, seen the cost of a social experiment with a leader like Duterte, because Duterte has set back the Philippines more than the number of years of his term as president. He has demolished a lot of institutions and national symbols and even cultural values. So I, I all administrations after Duterte must commit to wipe out that disease which had carried up, which had um, enveloped our national polity in 2016. Because that to me is a malaise, a malaise that, that, that should never happen again. So, and, 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 and so this, this talk about his running for the Senate and even to be vice president, if BP Sara is impeached, I, I read about it in the papers, uh, God forbid. I know that there's still remnants. I know that it's still there, the, the, the thirst of our people for quick fix solutions. And, and that is why there's, there's this, um, it's a frightening revelation during the time of Duterte. It's a frightening revelation on how you know, people accept what, what it could accept from a leader, even if it's something that violates or, or, or breaks the rule of law. So it's frightening because the people are willing to accept the kind of a setup, which is very injurious to democracy. I mean, we talked about, of course, Mandela in South Africa and all. I mean, we just had Argentina electing their latest version of a populist, right-wing populist. There's, there's still a chance that someone like Donald Trump may still come back to power in the United States. I mean, I, I mean, at the very least, I don't know if that's, that this should make us feel better, but it looks like Senator De Lima is like, this is a global malaise, right? It looks like people are losing faith in democratic institutions, whether it's in Argentina or in the United States. In Netherlands, they just also elected a far-right populist government. Um, so, mukhang hindi ito unique sa Pilipinas, right? This is like the flavor of the decade. If I can put it that way, uh, what do you have to say about that, Sir Dilema? Should that make us feel better, or that just underscores the enormity of challenge we face in fledgling democracies like the Philippines uh, as we try to fight for uh, civility and civil rights at the same time? We just have to continue doing that. We just have to be to continue asserting the values, the ideals of democracy, of rule of law, of justice, notwithstanding the trends that we're seeing worldwide because we we know which is the better system with all its loopholes with all its pitfalls with all its imperfections it's still democracy uh, that that is the ideal governmental setup all, all others can, can, may may be able to address certain certain fleeting problems and challenges of a particular state but it won't it won't last because it yields it produces further more serious problems in a country sir the dilemma i'm sorry i'm not i'm, I'm you i'm not forcing you to be a political analyst here but are there like um successful cases or are there like inspirational movements or leaders that that you think could uh, you know, uh, show us the way forward, uh, whether here in the Philippines, in Asia, in the U.S., in the West, 
are you looking at certain, let's say, gold standards or kind of a best practices perhaps to push back against this authoritarian, populist, Dutertismo kind of social political I'm matter? I'm sorry, I have, I have nothing in mind. I have no one in mind at, at the moment. I, I just have to... Uh, I'm so sorry to say that. I know, I know. <laughs> no, I just wonder yes. while you were in, uh, you know, in detention, whether... I mean, what were you reading? I mean, it, it, without uh, forcing a lot. Disciples. All sorts, all types of genre. Right. Serious stuffs, spiritual stuffs, even uh, romantic stuffs, right. detective novels, etc. All types. And I read several books at a time. So I finish a book and, and, and given to me by my visitors. So I have a hard time choosing which ones to read at first. And, and because I have so many choices, a lot, uh, various types, there's a variety of them. Sir, so is there like a five favorite? I mean, I, I know it's so hard when you have read so much. I mean, a friend of ours said 1,000 books pa lang from his side. Or no. I mean, if they're like top five, you can choose and recommend. I don't have my list. I have I have a list, but I don't have it now. <laughs> top of your mind. Top yeah. of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Alex, I, don't, I, I don't have it. I don't have or it. Or are there like authors or figures or something that you want people to check out if they're going also through difficult moments? Maybe not as difficult as yours, but you know, I'm I'm sure you can have a good lifestyle guru eh? because you know, you, next time, you know, <laughs> sige, sir, I'll check if, out my list. I'll check yeah, out my list. If forward, man, lang sa akin. Now, sir, mm -hmm. I have another question, of course. Um, you we are seeing some positive movements on uh, in terms of your case uh can you tell us a little bit about what are the next steps you're looking forward to i mean many would say that it looks like your full vindication is almost inevitable but obviously you don't want to be complacent um can you tell us a little bit about uh, what are you looking forward to in terms of the legal uh cases still uh, still against you and and are you cautiously optimistic this will be resolved in the near future, para yung full vindication yung is official, more or less. Although I think almost everyone believes, with exception of some groups, no, some cult group, na everything was really politically motivated as far as charges against you are concerned. Is very confident about the last about this uh, last case. Now I'm given provisional liberty, and uh, we're just waiting for the formal offer of evidence of the prosecution. And then if the court resolves it, we will file our demara to evidence. And if it's granted, then the case is dismissed, that is tantamount to acquittal. We are confident because after the presentation of their bail evidence, the bail testimonies, um, nothing of essence or nothing of significance could be added to the evidence that were presented during the bail hearings. And nothing could be added as to be discussed further in the judgment of the court later, as would reverse, or would change its finding of insufficiency of evidence, its finding of no conspiracy, because the charge is illegal conspiracy to commit illegal drug trading. So if at the bail stage of the case, the court already found no strong evidence, and if nothing more significant was presented in the course of the presentation of the evidence in chief, then the conclusion would be right. the same. Right, almost no sufficient evidence because the prosecution is a proof. If it failed to do so at the bail stage, what more this time? So we are confident, but still cautiously optimistic yes. about it. No, no room for complacency on that front. Uh, thank you also, yes. Attorney Delima. I mean, I mean, you being a lawyer also helps, you know, explaining uh, why you're cautiously op optimistic on this front. Now, uh, the, Attorney Delima, I mean, uh, let's talk about tormentors, right? I mean, is the next phase here to go against, I'm, of course, it's one, I mean, there are many unfortunate, unfortunately, many people fell for all of the black propaganda and worst and vulgarity that was deployed against you. But there's some people who knew very well that this was fake news. This was a politically motivated move. And yet they enabled it or they were orchestrating it. Uh, are you going to, 
uh, is the next step here for Senator De Lima to go after the tormentors? Because you talk about democracy and institutions. Democracy and institutions do not just you know come out of nowhere. You have to fight for them. And one of the ways is to fight against people who are undermining our judicial institutions. Yung mga pinababa yung mga institution natin, yung uh, justice system natin. Is that the next step, Senator De Lima? I mean, who, sino ba sila? <laughs> Dapat humanda na sila. <laughs> Um, definitely and absolutely we will file cases against them. They have to be held accountable for uh, my prosecution. Yet state, aside from, you know, I can already, and there will be some others that have to be held accountable for being responsible for, for this, the, the prosecution, for persuading, for coercing, for coming up with those fabricated evidence, those trumped up um, testimonies from the uh, PDL witnesses. So they use operators, they use handlers who approach, who talk to these witnesses for them to falsely testify against me. So they got to be held accountable. Definite or specific legal actions that, and as to when it will be filed that's also being discussed yeah again of course uh senator delima i didn't want to um <laughs> preempt your your legal strategy no i just wanted to say nah, the reason i'm asking this uh senator delima is because you know there's a tendency uh, you know i'm not going to name names that people you know they face injustice and then their case gets resolved and then they kind of you know, just say, okay, at least na save na ako, tapos na issue ko, I move on, right? When in fact, we know that what's happening to you, Senator De Lima, is part of a more systemic fundamental problem, right? Had we had strong institutions and strong democracy to begin with, I don't think they could have pulled off what they have pulled off against you. It, it exposed the fragility of our institutions. So, so the reason why I'm asking is because if you go after your tormentors and try to also make sure justice is served, this is in the long run, good for our institutions, right? This is a process of repairing the damage that was inflicted by the Duterte legacy, right? That's why I said this is the time to strengthen the institutions and to restore the faith of our people, especially in our justice system. The cooptation must end. The cooptation of institutions must end because the judiciary, all that it needs is for its independence to be upheld and it can be expected it, to uh, do its mandate properly in dispensing justice. Senator Delima, just to ask on this, I mean, you were the Justice Secretary back in the day. Um, what were the problems or gaps that you noticed when you were in charge of the Justice Secretary? And what were the things that you did as a Justice Secretary to at least not just in the right direction? Because, you know, like, you're a victim of a system that at one point you were also in charge of, right, as the Justice Secretary. So can we slightly talk about that, uh, Secretary? Uh, uh, well, se former I Secretary of the Lima, yeah. First, yes. I've been advocating for the fusion of the work of the prosecutors right i've been i've been pushing for that you know um, investigators should not be to not just be filing cases with weak evidence and one way to do it for, is for the prosecutors to get involved as early as the case build up and i think the current right. secretary of justice is also adopting that and i'm i think he also issued um, a department circular in that in that respect that is important because, um, you know, if, if there is high conviction rate and then there is certainty of punishment, and that is a major deterrent, a big deterrent to crimes, the commission of offenses. And right. then the delays is a perennial problem. Now, there are, of course, Supreme Court circulars mandating, um, mandatory, man mandating continuous trials, but this is not being complied with or observed strictly. So right. it's a matter also of appointing good people in the judiciary, competent, right. efficient, and upright members yeah. of the judiciary. Yeah. Crucial. Yes, merit should all should always be based on meritocracy. 
we, we, I've always been advocating for that. And, and and when it comes to our uh, judiciary in terms of, you know, like your backlog of cases, I mean, I think the Philippines has one of the worst cases in terms of, you know, congestion of the penitentiary system, in terms of pretrial detainees, including yourself, right? I mean, more than 50% based on the numbers I saw in 2019. I mean, this is like Central America level. I mean, it's one of the worst on earth. And, and, and also in terms of, you know, like a single judge has to deal with more than 700 cases per year. I mean, these numbers were so bad na na memorize ko tuloy. Like, I mean, um, so, I mean, how can you have a functioning democracy if the judicial institutions are so overwhelmed uh, with responsibilities and 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 perhaps there's so much capacity gap? I, I you know, I had conversations with former uh, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Sereno on this, but I want to take on your point who is in terms of the former, um, you know, uh, Justice Secretary. What is your take on that in terms of strengthening the the judiciary overall in terms of, you know, manpower, in terms of uh, institutional power. I'm sorry, Senator Dilima, I'm, I'm abusing you on this case, but it's just, you're such such an experienced person, unfortunately, on both sides of this case that I couldn't I go back. I yeah. go back really to appointing the right people. Yeah. If you have the right people insulated from politics, right. insulated from any other considerations other than their credentials, their qualifications, as members of the bar, as members of the bench, then we can expect an efficient, a truly functioning, effective judiciary and a justice system that truly works. I always go back to that because we have all the kinds of rules and regulations. We have the laws, we have the rules of procedure. All we, all we need are people with the right uh, intellect and the right motivation to fulfill their job properly and with excellence. That's it. It's, it's, it's a basic thing for me. So it's just back to the basics. That's that's your position, uh, Senator Dalima, that if we, we just do the basic diligence, the meritocracy and all, this should yes. carry us through the day, you know? Uh, and unfortunately, perhaps those basics were not done and there was an adulteration and bastardization of of the system. Now, just just in this case, Senator Delima, I mean, a former spokesman and some would say former human rights lawyer, Harry Roque, has implied that your you know your your current situation, the improvement in your case, had to do something with you know a favorite student of yours now overseeing your case. I mean, what do you have to say about those kinds of accusations? Yeah. In the first place, I don't ever remember that this judge has been my student. Yes, I, I was a professor of law and I've taught many students, hundreds of them. Yes, I would remember some of them, but not all. Honestly, I don't remember this judge as a student. Right. But if he was a student, how could Harry Rocky must stop peddling lies? Right. He must stop. <laughs> it's like it, 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 like someone say they're not surprised by this. And Senator Dima, what do you have to say in terms of repairing the institutions in terms of that? Um, now you have President uh, Marcus Jr. also saying that perhaps the Philippines will be open to uh, ICC investigations in the Philippines. How important do you think that is uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that human rights and democracy is upheld in the Philippines? Or are you encouraged by some indications that there's more push for proper look into asked atrocities in the previous administration. I see this as a very positive development, a very positive step. I've been pushing for that, that they allow the ICC investigation, notwithstanding our withdrawal from the um, Rome Statute or ICC. In fact, I've been pushing for the restoration of our ICC membership, which was unilaterally withdrawn by the former president because of self-interest in order to... Uh, insulate himself or to evade accountability. Now, this is a very good development. Now, this is not necessarily an indictment of the justice system if right. we do that. It's just that since it's being perceived or since the ICC have seen no local domestic or no local jurisdiction, no local authority investigating those with highest responsibility for this drug war killings, then it decided to intervene because that is 
that that is its mandate. So there is no violation at all of the principle of complementarity because the principle of complementarity says that if the, the um, domestic authority is able to do its own investigation of the crime, of a crime cognizable by the Rome Statute, then the ICC need not intervene. Now, they're, they're not seeing that. So what's wrong with the ICC continuing with its probe? So it's a very laudable initiative on the part of the congressmen, the members of the House who filed the resolution. Of course, it's just really because it's the decision. Ultimately, it's the decision of the executive, but it's the an expression of the sins of Congress if it would pass uh, the, the uh, legislative mill. No, and I, and I hope it would, that it would be ultimately formally adopted by the House and also by the Senate because it would have such a persuasive uh, effect on the executive. It's high time for them to rethink and reconsider their initial position of no intervention from the ICC. Oh, and last point, Very good. Thank you so much, Senator. I, I, I'm sorry. I know you're so exhausted. I don't want to overwhelm you with so many questions. Um, Senator Delima, um, the thing is, of course, one of the other legacies of the Duterte era is the weaponization of, of, uh, you know, any kind of supposedly legitimate restrictions on, you know, absolute expression, uh, freedom of expression. I mean, you had, you know, cyber law and and uh, cyber libel law, among others, and there was a lot of fear that this was weaponized under the previous administration. And and you know, one of the Victims, right? This is the position of them is uh, people like Congressman Walden Bellio. I mean, what do you have Absolutely. to say about those other cases? Yeah, um, this this alleged weaponization, and some people are saying perhaps this has to be taken to the Supreme Court and and perhaps push for decriminalization of cyber of cyber libel among others, uh, in order to make sure that this kind of abuses do not happen. What is your take as a as a, as a, as, a, as a legal mind and also someone who was a former Justice Secretary on this, and, and someone who was also a victim? of the weaponization of uh, uh, legal institutions and, and laws? I am all for the decriminalization of cyber law, of, of cyber libel, and uh, libel, libel, whether it's cyber, cyber libel or the, the, the libel under the revised position, but not criminalization, but uh, you, you know, the uh, punitive uh, aspect of it because it's right to free expression when I was there, but uh, it, it was never taken up. But I think uh, some senators had already filed a similar, a similar measure and even in the house. I hope they would seriously consider that and would pass that. And it's it's um it, it, it's 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 um not at all uh conducive to the environment of free expression if uh these kinds of laws persist criminalization or criminalized cy uh, cyber um libel and uh, libel under the revised penal code. And uh, attorney, are you uh, optimistic that perhaps we'll move on the right direction in terms of making sure that there's a correction or am amendment uh, amendments necessary, or making sure that people who were somehow victims of this in the past administration will also have uh, their moment of justice in the coming months or year? I mean, in short, I'm asking whether uh, you um, getting closer to getting the justice you deserve um, is is perhaps part of a bigger wave of correction of the abuses that happened in the past? Or perhaps are you cautiously optimistic? Yes, that the overall, environment seems yeah. to be conducive. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I can see that we have now an environment to uh, reassess all those draconian measures that should never be considered again uh, in the stream of consciousness under Philippine 
politics. Um, so I'm confident and I'm optimistic that we have the right environment now to rectify all those. And last, I forgot actually to ask this. Senator Delima, you had this very close call situation uh, during the pandemic, right? That you were held, held hostage by one of the detainees inside. Uh, yes. My goodness, I'm sorry. I don't want to you know, bring back the trauma, but we were really worried about what was going on there. I mean, to what degree can you share about that without... I'm sorry, I don't want to bring back your trauma, but it just tells the, the, the depth of your... Your your trial uh, over the past few years. It's not just being behind bars, but you were almost you know you were you were almost victimized. There. I really thought. Yeah, I really thought it was my end. Really, it was a serious incident. Really, um, oh, it was a Sunday early morning. I was praying the rosary at about six thirty. I had opened already my quarters, my, my cell, because the sun is up. Because I, I opened my, I opened my, there's light already outside. Now, those Abu Sayyaf detainees are supposed to be in a separate, they were in a separate compound, also locked, padlocked and all. But, tinaimingan nila, yung guard na naghatid ng breakfast. And isa lang kasi yung naghatid ng breakfast. So it was a security lapse. So this guy, this guard almost died. He was stabbed by this uh, detainees. And well, fortunately, the one assigned of the uh, tower was vigilant enough, was alert enough that he saw what was happening so he shot them, the two of them, only two out of the three. But the third one managed to, to uh, survive the, 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 uh, the shooting from the guy in the uh, tower. And he was able to climb because that was, as I said, it was a locked compound. And there was a barbed, barbed wire. But this guy climbed over that fence, ran, towards my own compound. And since he saw that my quarters was already open, he entered and then he, with a, uh, with a uh, improvised knife, he grabbed me, he uh, put his the knife here in my chest cons consistently all the time. The knife was here and he was saying, Pinatay na ho yung dalawa kong kasama, kailangan sumama kayo sa akin, ikaw lang ang paraan para makalabas ako ng buhay dito. And, but he was manhandling me also, he was pushing me, I would drip, and, I, and, and I, I had some hematoma here, and he was demanding for certain things, he was demanding for, for media, he was demanding for um, a, a, uh, a plane, C-130 to go to Zambang, to, to Sulu. He was demanding for a getaway vehicle, hammer vehicle. I said I could not, I sabi niya, uh, hingin mo yan. Kunin, uh, sabi mo sa kanila, dal, dalhin dito. Punta ko ng Sulu. And all, sasama kita. Sabi ko, hindi ko yan, maku hindi ko yan, hindi ko yan ma- I'm not in a position to demand for that. And then he was asking for my cell phone because he said he's gonna call for he was gonna call someone. I said I don't have cell phone. He said, No, uh impossible. No cell phone. No, I really don't have cell phone. Even if you kill me, uh, you won't see any cell phone here. Um Papa kita kung hindi mo ilalabas ang cell phone. There were several several times it would say that papatayin kita, papatayin kita and all. And then I was I really got scared when he said, when he started praying because he said, mom it's already, it's almost 7.10 if it's already, if it's 7.30 na hindi pa nila binibigay yung mga hinihingi ko papatayin kita. Isasama na kita. 
And then around 7.15, that's when he started praying in Islam. And he said, Mom, mukhang wala mang nangyayari dun sa mga request ko. So ito na. Ito na. Pasensya na. Mamamatay na tayo. Isasama kita. So we prayed. So I knew it. So that's it. That's the time. So I started praying. Bahala na kayo, Lord. Bahala na kayo sa pamilya ko. And my additional request was, please, Lord, make it quick. I do not want to suffer. No, no, uh, quick, no, 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 you know, uh, uh, bleed to, bleeding to death. So make it quick, just one. And that's it, that just once, and then that's it. But then he made a mistake of asking for water. And it so happened the director was there. He was the one, he was the one negotiating with him. And the director was saying, Dito ka sa labas so we can talk. But he said, No, alam ko papatayin niyo ako. Because he doesn't want to, he didn't want to leave me because I was, I was just on a, I was sitting down with my hand tied, blindfolded, with my feet tied, and with his with a knife here, consistently here, always, you know, sometimes it's, it's, he would push it hard and I would shout, I would scream, wag naman ganyan, ang sakit, ang sakit. And so, uh, when he asked for that water, that's when I said, as I said, he made, he made a mistake kasi no, inaabot na sa kanya, the, the, the director of SPES had the chance of shooting him. Nakaredi na pala. The director of SPES, he had with him a hidden, a short, small firearm. So when he was, he was handing over the glass of water, medyo lumayo yung knife dito sa chest ko. Uh, so I almost died. I re I thought it was my end. It was terrible. I, I didn't see when I, I since I was blindfolded, and I I, Wait, I did not. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. I, I was blindfolded. My hands were tied. My feet were tied, and I was sitting. So um, I I did I didn't even know that when he was being handed that water, that the officer was ready to shoot him down. I just heard. The next thing I knew, the next thing that happened was four consecutive shots, close range. I did not see the guy fall when he was shot. So it was an instant death for the guy. And I was taken out. I never saw him because my blind uh, pole was, uh, was taken out when I was out already of my quarters. So it was a harrowing yeah, experience. Yeah. So they had to bring me to the hospital for several days for examination. And I had uh, trauma here, chest trauma. I'm sorry, uh, Senator, for asking that because that was one of the the moments like lahat kami, we were extremely worried about you and we were also extremely about thinking about, I mean, what are the broader implications here, if God forbid. No. Um, Senator Delima, do you think that was a lapse Talaga? Was it like a complete accident or you're wondering maybe there was a foul play or some some wishy-washy things happening? I mean, have you reflected on that aspect? Um, Because some were wondering if you were properly... I've been thinking about of. it. I've been thinking about it. There is a theory about it. it. It may not, you know, it's... First, was I... Did they really intend to make me a hostage? A hostage. Okay. And I think, yes... Because how could they, how could they have gone out, or how could they ever think of coming out of the custodial center without a human shield? And who would be the best choice for a hostage? And I'm the high, most high profile detainee there. But as to whether it's something else, there's something else or someone else behind it. It remains to be a speculation. Yeah. It's hard to prove, but uh, 
it's a possibility, but only a speculation at this point. Um and and Senator Dilema, do you think after I mean after surviving yet another ordeal like that, you think God was telling you that you have a mission that there's this another chapter in your life? I mean, usually when you survive something as close as that. You come, I mean, you were already going through a lot of spiritual awakening and transformation, but I mean, this is next level, right? I mean, did you feel that maybe God really has a mission for me that I have to really fight for something and be someone after this? Very close. I always, to say. I always believe that if it's your time, if it, it's your time. And since I survived it, so I do think that siguro nga, siguro nga, meron pang dapat akong gawin, meron pang kailangan gawin. I, I do believe that I survived it. So that means it's not yet my time and probably I still have submission in life. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Delima. I mean, I wanted to ask you more about what's the next and all of that, but I know you want to rest. Uh, there's, the dust has not completely settled yet, so I'm sorry. I don't want to come off as parang ina buso ko yung yung openness mo and your kindness and generosity for sharing your time with me. I'm so sorry if I brought back some of this trauma, but let me tell you, Senator Delima, lahat kami nagmamal sa yo. We have been praying for you. You don't know how how happy we are. I mean, just the word joy doesn't even capture having this opportunity, having this conversation with me, and God willing, and inshallah, you know, in the near future we can have a chance to catch up together in person, and and you know. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're... Yes, you're, I would love that. I would love that. Let's, and you're uh, such an inspiration, Senator Delima. I, I really mean it. I really, really mean it, Senator Delima. You're you're such an inspiration. I mean, I was not born until after ETSA, so I didn't have a chance to, you know, um, see the Ninoy Aquino moment and all of that. Um, and Thank you for all the compassion. Thank you. It is solidarity, Senator Delima. Remember I said something about, you know, the fight for democracy is a fight for solidarity. You know, we have many heroes who have their own heroism and all, but it's really about bringing people together. And I hope that yes. you will be that center of gravity yes. for a new generation of, you know, great heroic leaders we have had. Marami salamat. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Leila Delima. Everyone is praying uh, for you. Everyone loves you and everyone's expressing uh, their, their best wishes for you. So please take care of yourself and please forgive me for abusing you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure and I do want to see you also in person. God Ciao. willing. God willing. Thank you so much. Thank you so and, much. Uh, Thank you. Praise for you. Talk to you Thank soon. Thank you so much. God bless. Yeah.